That's where Christmas is being given. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah they're wise. Yeah. 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 GHS and Santa Barbara. Oh, nice. Yeah. I'm Tracy. Three I'm Dr. Tarazzi's assistant. I'm Vernon Johnson. Oh, Vernon. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Thank you. Uh, Evan, do you have a link to Gotcha. Understood.
All right, uh, good evening everybody and welcome to this regularly scheduled board meeting of the Glendora Unified School District Board of Education. Um, we are reconvening open session at 7.06 p.m. Uh, please let the record reflect that all board members are present this evening and I'm going to call on our student board representative for uh, the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Uh, please stand. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, Gwen. Um, report of action taken in closed session. We had three items um, that we took action on in closed session this evening. Um, item, oh, they are, hang on one second, sorry. Item 2.3, the Glendora Unified Board of Trustees in closed session upon a motion from Mr. Clifford, seconded by Mrs. Garcia, and a vote of five yes, zero no, has approved the settlement agreement for OAH case number 20230102295. Two zero two three zero five zero four seven six, and two zero two three oh nine oh eight three six. Item two point seven: The Glendora Unified Board of Trustees in closed session upon a motion by Mr. Clifford and seconded by Mrs. Merkley, and a vote of five yes, zero no, has approved the stipulated agreement for student case number two three nine two eight seven. And finally, we are pleased to announce with a motion by Mrs. Reuter, seconded by Mrs. Garcia, with a vote of five yes and zero no, that the Board of Education in closed session has appointed Aaron Meza to be the Director of Nutrition Services. The appointment effective date will be determined at a later date, and she will be placed on step two of the classified management salary schedule. Congratulations to Chef Aaron. I believe she's going to visit us at our next meeting so that everybody can be introduced to her. Those are all of our closed session um, action taken this evening. Um, may I please have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The agenda is adopted as presented. Welcome. We're happy to have you all here this evening. Um, we're going to move right into the uh, fun part of the evening. Always is our, our, our board recognition. Um, and tonight we are recognizing a group of very, very hardworking, committed individuals to the Glendora Unified School District. And I'm going to ask our council PTA president, Stacy Dover, to come up and introduce everyone, please. Good evening. Thank you for having us tonight. Um, it's my pleasure to share, excuse me, that... Um, I've been a G GUSD parent since 2006 and have enjoyed serving my kids' schools through their PTAs. These PTA presidents here have over 120 years of combined volunteer experience within Glendora Unified. And they are working towards the common goal of supporting the school community in ways unique to each site. I would like to introduce our presidents. Um, starting with Glendora High School, we have Verna Johnson. Uh, 
Um, for Whitcomb High School, we have Marianne Nichols, who I don't think is here right now. I will. <laughs> <laughs> it's the new flavor of the bunt cake. Oh, yum. Okay, and then for Goddard Middle School, we have Melissa Apodaca. Thank you so much. For uh, Sandberg Middle School, we have Teresa Quijano. For Stanton Elementary, we have Allison Thomas. For Sutherland Elementary, we have Angie London. For La Fetra Elementary, we have Stephanie Rizek. For Sellers, we have Jackie Neep. And finally, for Colin, we have Stacy Tarzia. Okay, ladies, don't run away. I am sure that our board members have something that they would like to say to our um, wonderful PTA president. I would love to say something. I turn on my mic first. I want to say thank you, ladies. Um, as a PTA mom myself, I've worked with many of you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for all that you do for our students and our teachers and all the sites across the district. I don't have the numbers, but I remember seeing them once upon a time as far as the amount of hours that unpaid hours that our parent volunteers, our PTA uh, parents put in. And there's just no way we as a district would be able to afford that kind of manpower. So GUSD is very unique in the amount of uh, parent participation that we have. Uh, the district that I grew up in, we didn't have parents that were able to. Uh, many because they were working, and so I know that we are small but mighty, and I love that about you. I love that um, PTA is very collaborative, uh, very inclusive. Um, everything that you guys do to make sure that our students have fun um, and educational experiences really does add to their um, educational experience at GUSD, and there is just no way to replace uh, what you guys do, so thank you. Um, in addition to that, because I had it on my thank yous for today since I have you, thank you for the beautification of our campus during Red Ribbon Week. Um, I personally have done those ribbons, so I know what it takes. And I appreciate you taking the time to do that, to, to plan it all out, to uh, gather more support, uh, donations, um, more parents on the Sunday to go and decorate the schools. It takes a lot, and it's a lot that our community doesn't see. So I'm so grateful that we're able to honor you tonight and um, just give you a Big, fat, thank you, and a big hug. <laughs> well, um, I'd say be careful, because that's where I started, and now I'm here. Whoa. Just saying, I've been PTA president for, at four units and council here in Glendora, so I know how much work goes into it and how much love it is. I think it is one of the best positions is being involved in PTA. It, it changed my life. I made so many good friends, and... When I was council president, we had a check, you know, one of those fake checks that we gave to the district because I think that way it made it more visual as to how much um, PTA people contribute to the district. Yeah, well, the, the Stacy just note to self. <laughs> yeah, because it, it really is powerful to see that because there is so much untold service. And with those historian reports, we always doubled whatever the hours were on the sign-in sheets and stuff because 
people go in and they under report almost all the time. You say, you know, you've put in two hours this month, when in reality, we all know you put in 10 or 20 each week. So thank you. The district would not be the same without your effort. I just want to recognize, I think they were all women up here. I didn't see any men, so I want to challenge some of the we men. Have some. Uh, they, before, they were, not, to, not tonight. No, not yeah. tonight. I'm just challenging yeah. them because I heard the word manpower, and my wife would tell you that woman power far, out, uh, far exceeds manpower. That's her words, not mine. Mm -hmm. But I was cleaning out the garage the other night and saw that she was the, the, the president of a PTA way back in the day at Sutherland, and I just remember the power and the, the, the spirit of volunteerism, which is the backbone of this community, um, and I, I really am impressed by volunteerism, uh, the, just the acronym PTA, parent teachers, and the association bringing it together is awesome to me. Um, but more importantly, remember that the only thing more powerful than a parent teacher is a grandparent teacher. So that with that next generation, because mostly in Glendora, like you know, my children, one of them lives here, and so now they're PTA members. But we're also PTA members. I think we all joined we all the Glendora PTA mm -hmm. up here. So a, a, a grandparent teacher association is pretty powerful too. So don't forget that. We're, we're out there for you. And thank you very much for being here tonight. Don't let that cake stay there too long because I'll take it. <laughs> I'm still on with Kim PTA, Sam, just saying. <laughs> Thank you all from a principal who needs PTA. We don't, we can't do what we do on our campuses without your power. And so I, I've always appreciated the PTA. You guys do a lot. And um, sometimes it, it, it's really hard work. Um, and sometimes you get to the high school, maybe it's not as many people because there's booster clubs and different things like that, but it's still a lot of work. So we appreciate everything you do and especially from a principal. Thank you. Um, I do want to um, also talk about how um, we, we talk as a board about meeting every kid where they are in Glendora Unified, trying to find a special something that gets a kid excited to come to school every day. And it might not be math or it might not be, um, but it might be the a, a playground structure or it might be some th things that the PTA have done. Uh, for our students and for our sites this way. So it's the little things, it's the little details um, that are helping meet all of our kids' needs that make them excited to come to Glendora Unified where then we can teach them, right? But it's meeting those needs for every single kid. Um, and I do want to say that I know how hard it is to get volunteers to help you all out. Um, I feel like I have... Um, seen Verna and Stacy at every single something for all the years that my kids have been in Glendora Unified. And I don't I want to minimize anybody who I'm, I'm sorry if I don't um, I don't know you well enough, but it is really hard to get volunteers and to get people excited to do these things. So uh, thank you for what you're doing and thank you for inspiring others to help you. Uh, maybe you have to like beg, borrow and steal to get the work done sometimes, but you're in there for it for your kids and for all the kids in Glendora Unified. So thank you very much. Really appreciate you all. Okay. You, you are welcome to stay for the rest of the meeting. We have a really interesting bond survey to talk about and um, an annual report on our finances. You're welcome to stay for it. Um, uh, the next is a statement from the board president. I really don't have much of a statement. We'll give you all a minute if you want to um, take your leave. I understand. And then we'll move on to public comment here in a moment. Is anybody going to be at the high school tomorrow where they could drop the one off at, uh, on, in Marianne's office? You don't have to. You don't. I mean, we can, too. OK, thank you. Thank you. I know. We're going to ask her, Stacy. we're going to check yeah. with her to make sure you gave it to her. Yeah, if they take that home, it's not me.
Okay, we're gonna move on to our next agenda item for the evening, and um, that's going to be a public comment. I have two public comment cards this evening. Um, I asked for you last time, Mr. Lopez. I'm glad that you. Uh, I'm glad that you came. Yeah, and thank you for that. So it was um, rather exciting to hear my name announced on TV. <laughs> and so, it, and that happened to, 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 in relation to um, Glendora High's track and field. And so it was exciting to hear about that. And so now um, I did send off an email asking if there would be opportunities for volunteers to work with um, the district on uh, making plans, working with contractors, creating volunteer committees, and I am certainly one to do that, and I have several friends in the district who, um, over dinner and a beer, um, have talked about um, improving the track and field, so we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, and, I, and, and so in other conversations, there was um, some talk about um, a bond measure. And I, I certainly hope that um, that is one direction we go to raise the funds for the track and field. And I would certainly be um, volunteering for that as well to help, to help where I can with that. Um, moving on to the um, community committee and ethnic studies. And as I recall, some of our teachers should be going to a conference this week. Three days? Good, good. And um, maybe you'll, Dr. Prince, you'll, you'll enlighten us a, a little bit on that. So uh, a conference taking um, over three days this week. I'm learning more about ethnic studies and some of the other schools that have um, already begun um, a curriculum in, in ethnic studies. I, I would just caution us um, that we that we take our own route, that we choose our own curriculum, that we don't just fall into the pattern of somebody's already done it, so let's take the easier path. Um, it's gonna be a hard road, and we've only got a couple of years to do this, but I think it's important that we choose the road that um, represents our community, that represents Glendora Unified School District. And so I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to our next meeting should be coming up soon with the community committee, I hope. And um, with that, I'll thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lopez. Next, we have Jennifer Kennedy. Hi there, good evening, board. On October 9th, I'm Jennifer Kennedy, I'm a local attorney, we've, we've met before. On October 9th, this board declined to adopt a policy of notifying parents when their children ask school staff to assist them in socially transitioning on campus by addressing them by a new name or new pronouns and by allowing them to use opposite sex bathrooms. The general comments by the board that night were that Glendora's existing policies and procedures regarding children identifying at school as transgender are sufficient. The trouble is, Glendora's current policy that you reaffirmed and readopted is parent secrecy. The current policy is to conceal critical behavioral information from parents. And you just re-upped that, which is a bad look, number one but it also exposes you to liability. I know there's been a lot of discussion in all of these board meetings about, oh, who doesn't want to get sued? Who wants to be sued by Rob Bonta for having a parental notification policy, our attorney general? The problem is you're going to have to choose uh, who would you like to be sued by? Angry parents who are betrayed and find out this information about their child through the grapevine, or Rob Bonta, who already sued Chino, and is not going to be suing anybody else because he's running for re-election. And he already has one little ruling in his back pocket. The problem with what is happening in Glendora is Administrative Regulation 5145.3. That is the regulation that gives disparate treatment to children who identify as transgender. And the disparate treatment is that only those kids are allowed to ask school staff school administrators, and school teachers to lie to their parents. Only transgender children, children identifying as transgender, are allowed to um, conceal information from their parents and have people collude with them. 
So flip that, do we have any other group of children on campus that is allowed to ask staff to work with them in concealing behavior from their parents that they might get in trouble for, or that their parents might not like, or their parents might react negatively? For example, do we have kids who are failing and are at risk of retention? Maybe those kids are Hispanic. And there's a policy that we're not gonna tell the Hispanic parents about that because they're hotheads. They're really gonna come down on that kid. Is there a policy of uh, maybe a child, a student who skips class to go um, fool around behind the gym? She skips class and you need to notify parents about that, but is that kid going to be able to ask the staff to lie to her parents because she doesn't want them to know she was messing around with some guy behind the gym? Is there any other class of children in the Glendora School District that is allowed to have your help in lying to their parents? There isn't. And I recommend you have a relook at that policy. Thank you. Thank you. Those are the only public comment cards I have this evening. We're gonna move on to our student board member report, Gwen. Hi, thank you. So, starting off with LaFetra Elementary, um, our move-a-thon, our PTA move-a-thon is scheduled for October 30th. Families have been raising money for the last two weeks, and students have already earned Silly Hat Day and Bubble Mania Morning, which sounds amazing. <laughs> uh, digital citizenship. LaFetra actively participated in digital citizenship this week. Um, just like the rest of the district. Throughout this week, our dedicated teachers provided daily lessons on digital citizenship to our students. These valuable lessons equipped our students with the knowledge and skills to safeguard themselves online and to become responsible di digital citizens. The Bully Game Assembly. Our students recently attended a magic show assembly called The Bully Game, where they witnessed an incredible magician, uh, sorry, yes, an incredible magician, during the show, they learned valuable lessons on anti-bullying, friendship, and kindness towards others. Red Ribbon Week. This week, our school and classroom doors have been beautifully adored from top to bottom in celebration of Red Ribbon Week, a special event dedicated to raising awareness about the import importance of saying no to drugs. Throughout this week, our students will actively engage in a variety of daily activities that aim to encourage and promote healthy choices. Next, from Sellers Elementary, the Walkathon. Our PTA Walkathon was a huge success. We raised over $60,000. We are so thankful to our community of, support, of supporters for helping us raise this much money for our students. We also want to thank our PTA for their hard work and dedication to our students. They came in and set up and did all the hard work. There were nine students who raised over $500 and will get to pie Mrs. Trent in the face. <laughs> there are over 100 students who earned a special pizza lunch with the principal as well, and several students will get to be principal for the day. Red Ribbon Week is this week, with lots of different activities to help students remember to say no to drugs. We will wear neon pajamas, crazy hair, and team jerseys. Our fourth and fifth graders will get to experience an assembly with the group Music Notes, where they talk to the students about the dangers of vaping. We also have the BMX bike riders on campus to continue the celebration. It will be a fun week full of meaningful activities and messages. Sellers Vikings took part in Digital Citizenship Week, the week of October 16th through 20th. Each student took on the task of providing, sorry, each teacher took on the task of providing useful lessons full of information on how to be a good digital citizen and maintain positive online presence. These lessons spurred on some good conversations and students walked away having a better understanding of how important digital citizenship is to everyone who has a digital footprint. Our annual walkathon, or sorry, our annual walk to school day was a success with lots of turnout. We added one walk stop, bringing our total of walk stops to three. Mrs. Rice's kindergarten class had 100% of their students walk to school on that day, earning the coveted Golden Shoe Trophy. Way to go, Mrs. Rice's class. From Goddard Middle School, 
Um, our final preparations have been made to host students and educators from MOCA Japan. They will arrive on Friday afternoon. We have many activities planned for both the students and educators. Thank you to all the host families for all their preparations and effort to make this a memorable trip for our Japanese students. ASB is planning our biggest, baddest, most amazing Halloween dance ever. ASB pres presents the Nightmare on Sierra Madre dance. We are conjuring up an enchanting atmosphere with spine-tingling decorations, brand new games, a top-tier DJ, delectable treats, and a treasure trove of unforgettable moments. Our MOCA Japan students will also be joining us for that dance, so it is going to be an amazing time for everyone. The annual Goddard Food Drive started on October 16th and will go through Halloween. The food donations will go to the Glendora Community Coordinating Council. They will in turn make food baskets and deliver them to families in needs. Goddard's Web Mon Monster Challenge event was a huge success. Sixth graders and their web leaders had a blast as parents cheered students on. Goddard held a mini club rush event during lunch where club presidents presented information about all the different club, clubs offerings offered at Goddard. The Goddard PTA fundraiser kicked off on Friday the 13th and will run through Halloween. PTA is giving away two tickets to Disneyland and every student has a chance to win them. To increase your chances of winning, you can buy extra entries, one for $10 or three for $25. PTA is hoping that every family will donate $25. Families can donate through the link on Rocketeer newsletter. Finally, from Whitcomb, we have two students who have earned perfect attendance this quarter, Sylvan Ho and Carlos Sandova. San Sandoval, sorry. <laughs> Carlos also received a 4.0 for this quarter. We look forward to honoring both of them at the recognition brunch next week. We continue to recognize students who have good attendance weekly by choosing a Wildcat of the Week. Our pickleball tournament has concluded with our winners being Aaron Tommaso and Ella Daly. In second place was Theo Flynn and Ryan Klinkenborn. Yes, Klinkenborn, sorry. <laughs> uh, these students will receive a gift card to In-N-Out. We held Whitcomb Homecoming on Friday. The theme was Nightmare Before Hoko. Our court was announced and students voted for the King, Queen, and Jack. Winners were King, Ethan, Batista, sorry, names are not my strong suit. Our Queen was Mary Lou Pedroza, and our Jack was Sylvan Ho. They were crowned during the homecoming event. Our annual door decorating contest is currently underway. The theme is classic horror movies. Voting will take place next week. The winning door will get points towards a class pizza party that will be sponsored by the PTA. We are gearing up for Red Ribbon Week next week. There will be daily themes where students who participate can earn points towards a pizza party. We are also starting to our C's Candy fundraiser to raise money for our prom. We hope to earn enough money to keep the cost of prom to $30 each and make prom accessible to all students who wish to attend. Our quarterly recognition brunch is coming up on October 26th. We are grateful for all the support and donations from the community partners, parents that allow us to recognize the achievement of our Whitcomb students. We'll be honoring, honoring student of the month, our principal's honor roll, and perfect attendance. Um, in our monthly staff meeting, we are preparing for WASC by looking at our vision and reflecting on our why for teaching. We are asking the questions, what is our purpose, what is our main purpose, what is our main strength, and what do we value? We are also reflecting on how to improve our curriculum and increase our rigor in classes. We will continue this work throughout the year to prepare for WASC next year. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. I would encourage my um, fellow board members to participate in the door voting uh, session. We've got to find out what day that they're going to be doing that. Um, these teachers really, really go for it at Whitcomb with their door decoration for Halloween. So I participated last year, and it's really a lot of fun. What time is the breakfast? Yeah, just give me what? I know. The so breakfast? Do it now. 10, okay. 15. Okay. Okay, no. I was in Utah, and so... Wednesday. Thursday. Thursday. 
this Thursday at 10.15. Okay, it's in your calendar, yeah. Okay, we're on to comments from members of the Board of Education. Do you need a minute? No, I'm good. Okay, go ahead. First off, Gwen, I wanna tell you, sitting up here listening to a student talk about positive presence online, anti-bullying, friendship, kindness. I, I love this district, I can't, I mean, that's coming from you, not coming from us. And your, your presentation was positive and charismatic, and it just makes me very proud to be up here. And I appreciate what you're doing, and um, I do feel that sense of positivity when I'm out on the campuses with all of the students, so thank you for that reflection. You made me feel very, very good right now. Um, I get to be the first one that talks about the parade. Thank you so much. What a great, what do you call it, uh, Superintendent, the longest, shortest parade? But it was, uh, it was so much fun to see hometown Glendora show up on a Friday afternoon and stand along Glendora Avenue. And um, what a great time just seeing everybody old and new. Uh, that was really fun. And the game turned out well for, uh, for Glendora in, in general. And uh, that was just a good day. So thank you for everyone who participated, for the board and, and, and all of the floats. And every, I was, when I was driving home, I was driving home be uh, behind Tiny Toon Float, and part of it blew out onto Foothill. So I, I hope they didn't need that for later in the day when they went back to school. But uh, that was important. I also want, uh, I want to thank the public speakers tonight that came. Um, first off, you know, we did make a motion for the high school to get on board with getting it repaired. And in my little mind, that means right now, start working on it now and get an estimate and look where we have funds. Uh, our students deserve to have a place to exercise, have track meets, do the track and field. If we can't have a full football game there, there's many other activities that a world-class high school should have. And so we're going to get on that. Uh, and get it started as soon as possible, uh, I'm hoping. So thank you for those comments, and thank you for the comments about uh, the uh, the parents' rights that we went through. Uh, you know where I am on that, and we'll continue to move you know, towards some kind of agreement there. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge those public speakers. I also want you to know that uh, as a, since the last meeting, I've had several meetings with parents, law enforcement agencies, school administrators, on our, uh, our, our, our parents, our children, and school safety. And I know right now there's a lot of stuff going on out in the world, but I can tell you this with certainty, that the city of Glendora, city council, is taking our safety very serious right now. And as events happened throughout the weeks, we were notified of what the city was doing to make us feel good. Uh, the city was giving us extra patrol at our schools, and for all of you that, that may not know this, um, there are people that didn't know this, unfortunately. Sutherland School is not in Glendora. Where is Sutherland School? It's in San Dimas. So Glendora Police Department protects all of our schools. Sutherland School is protected by the Sheriff's Department. Um, we had meetings with the Sheriff Captain, with the sheriffs that patrol that area. Uh, they've met with the high school principal, uh, the, the, the Sutherland Elementary principal, had discussions with our staff and with the principal about having even a bigger presence there. So um, although I do see Glendora police cars there all the time, I'm grateful for that. That's actually the sheriff's department's responsibility. But this board and your superintendent and our administrators take our children's safety very serious. And there's been several... Um, you know, security increases and a constant monitoring on our children um, during this tumultuous time. And uh, everybody's dusting off their emergency preparedness programs. And uh, I'm convinced that the uh, Glendora Police Department, the City of Glendora, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department are doing everything they can to increase their presence around our schools. I think you would agree with that. And so I'll keep that to my comments. Thank you very much. I'll keep it very short. I There's two things I wanted to talk about. Homecoming was amazing. Thank you, Gary, for your recap. Um, I recently attended a Zoom gate meeting for parents uh, with uh, students in the gate program. And it was led by um, Ms. Daniela Kent. And I kind of want to publicly um, congratulate her for her efforts uh, to 
bring in this parent involvement um, because it was a great meeting, great turnout, and we had so many great ideas from the community members, the parents who have seen um, areas uh, of improvement and uh, but also gave so many great ideas that I think Ms. Kent can uh, work with and move the program forward. So I know I get a lot of questions from parents about the GATE program. So I wanted as a parent to let them know that uh, there's great ideas and great movement in that department. And I'm looking forward to seeing um, what she does with that program. So kudos to Ms. Kent. Um, Second, I wanted to just publicly say congratulations to the National Honor Society inductees. We went to the uh, ceremony this week, and was it last week? Last week. And I think it was 75 students that were inducted into the National Honor Society, and very impressive uh, what they are expected to do, what they have done so far just to be admitted into the society. I'm very proud of our students, and I look forward, I, I know that they are going to do big things, and I'm very proud of them. Um, one more thing, the Goddard Monster Challenge. I always have to, Dr. A is just amazing, and um, he doesn't pay me for this, I promise. <laughs> but the Goddard Monster Challenge, I this was my first time attending because my, my son is in eighth grade. When my daughter was in eighth grade and sixth grade, it was COVID. So she didn't get to participate in those things. So this is my first time experiencing uh, the Monster Challenge, and boy, was it crazy. I think it kind of on par with action, but on a smaller level. But man, it was wild. It was fun. The kids, I'm pretty sure none of them could speak the day after because they were yelling so much. But it was, it was so much fun. So if you have an eighth grader next year or a sixth grader next year, I highly encourage you to go to that. It's just so much fun. Make sure you bring a flag. I was the only parent with a white flag to root for my team, and it was pretty popular. <laughs> um, so anyway, if you get a chance to do that, please uh, please go, because those, those uh, community moments, those moments to see your, your kids just having fun, it's got nothing to do with academics. It's about teamwork. It's If you don't know about the Goddard uh, Monster Challenge, it's the eighth uh, grade web leaders uh, basically uh, are the coaches for the sixth graders. And so they build this uh, team together and just kind of help them win. And they're divided by colors. And it's a great challenge and teamwork. And you just see them rooting for each other and just having a good old time. So thank you, Dr. A, for creating such a positive uh, teamwork environment in our schools. I appreciate you. I just have a couple of little comments. Sorry, let me get my book. I thought I had a minute with these two. Um, okay, uh, a couple of things that I would like to um, speak about this evening. Last week on Thursday, um, our wonderful district nurse, Sonia, um, held an immunization clinic here in the district boardroom where um, both flu and COVID shots were made available to all employees of the district. And I just wanted to recognize how um, thoughtful and convenient that is for our um, district nursing staff to be providing that opportunity. Um, everything's being run through insurance now. It's not like how it used to be with the, with the immunization clinics where you could just come and just go through a line. But it was a very seamless process. I came in on Thursday afternoon, and um, I, I think it's just a really nice service to our, to our employees. I believe that she is attempting to um, hold subsequent clinics, but um, uh, that's going to be uh, information that she will get out as, as they become available. Um, I also had a great time at the homecoming parade on Friday afternoon. Um, thank you to Mrs. Clune and the ASB for all of their hard work, the organization, the, the logistical collaboration, everything. They, they really do a, um, a standout job on that. Um, uh, I was asked a question by a, um, I'm not going to say better board member than I am, but a certainly much more practice and seasoned one yesterday that I promised I would, um, I would ask. Um, she was very excited to hear about the girls playing flag football next year, but wanted to make sure that we were being responsible with our Title IX um, requirements. So what are we either adding or taking away in order to be able to have that ladies flag football team? 
we, we will research that further. But yeah, we, we are aware of that concern, and we will definitely look at that and look at the total number of sports because we looked at that very issue the last time we added the sport. So it so. is. It, 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 we are within yeah. compliance for sure. Yeah. We yeah. just don't have. Yeah, I think we right had now. last yeah. sport we added was girls wrestling, and this is obviously another it additional could be the girls sport. Other things that we provided additional okay. resources for. So yeah. okay. Yeah. All right, well, Mrs. Blum will be waiting for yes, your response. Yes, she, she mentioned it to me as well. Okay, good. Um, it was great to see her yesterday, which um, segues me into my final comment um, for my board member comments, um, where I had the um, honor to attend um, Dr. Gomer's uh, memorial service yesterday with many of my colleagues up here on the dais. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, Dr. Gomer served five terms on this school board. 20 years is really um, quite a remarkable accomplishment. It was a pleasure to hear from two of his friends, two of his sisters, and both of his daughters. And I would say all of them, or close to all of them, mentioned um, his service to the Glendora Unified School District as a board member and how... Um, important and passionate he was about serving all of the students here in Glendora Unified. It's um, really big shoes to fill that way. Um, so I really actually want to take the time to thank all of my colleagues for what they do and the time that it takes. We all know that um, we have these couple of board meetings a month that may seem like they just take a couple of hours out of our schedules. But if you ask Mr. Clifford here, he'll tell you how many hours he's um, spending weekly working on the school board because he calls me about it. So, um, no, I really do want to thank, um, sincerely thank all, all four of you for the um, time, effort, and commitment um, to serve in a, um, a volunteer position this way and um, want to extend... Um, my deepest sympathies to the Gomer family and their friends. Um, there was a sellout crowd at the uh, church yesterday and at Glendora Country Club for the um, for the reception afterwards. And um, he did a remarkable job in his life bringing everyone together. And um, while I wish it had been other under different circumstances, it was a pleasure to to see everybody that that came there from all the years, um, certainly that I've been in Glendora, but the the thirty some odd years that that uh, Chuck and Tricia have been members of this community. So um, just really a, a special afternoon that I wanted to um, give a recognition to. Dr. DeGrazia, it's up to you. Thank you, President Reuter, members of the board, distinguished guests. We talked about MOCA arriving this week. That is the first time in four years for Sandberg Middle School and five years for Goddard Middle School. So it will be great to welcome our friends back. You will start seeing them in the community, 60 of them, approximately 60 students, about 30 for, for each school, and six adults, three adults, one teacher or one principal and two teachers from each school. Nakamura Junior High School for Sandberg and Mocha Higashi Junior High School for Goddard. They'll spend a few days here. They will have some wonderful welcome assemblies on the 30th. They will enjoy Halloween immensely on the 31st, and they will depart actually Glendora on the 1st. They have some things they're doing in Los, Ange Los Angeles on the 2nd, but they will fly out, I believe, on the 3rd, the day after uh, that. Um, we talked a little bit about test scores last time and test scores being released and being uh, public uh, by school and district from the spring. Very interesting to note, maybe not surprising. Absenteeism plays a major factor and played a major factor in our test scores, and I'm sure, I'm certain, other district test scores up and down the state. Here's the differences that we saw here in Glendora. Those attending regularly scored more than 20% percentage points higher in the subjects of English language arts and mathematics in the Glendora Unified School District. So consistency in attendance is huge. We are seeing that back this year for the second full month. We have maintained 96% of attendance at all of our schools as, as an, on average at all of our schools, which is really outstanding. Uh, so we want to continue to maintain that and note the importance of attendance being, he being here at school each and every day. We heard about homecoming, wonderful pieces with Wickham High School and Glendora High, the parade, the court, the game, the dance, all resounding successes. Much thanks to Mrs. Clune at Glendora High School and Mrs. Shook, the Wickham librarian. She puts in extra hours and efforts 
all over the place at Wickham High School, some seen, some not. And so we wanted to appreciate her and thank her for making that happen. The foundation tomorrow night will be hosting their STEAM uh, Fall Festival night. It will be downtown Glendora at the bus depot. It will be the first event ever held outside at the bus depot. Um, we anticipate it to be a, a, a widely attended. I know last week they already had nearly 200 RSVPs for the event. Um, five to eight, you don't have to stay for the whole time. You can come at different times. Uh, and they will, there will be different stations. We will have performances from our music groups throughout the district. There will be a STEAM focus, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. There will be stations for students. And Sparky, our robot, jointly purchased through the collaboration of the district and the foundation, he will make his first appearance and have, have a few things to say uh, tomorrow at the event. So come by and join us. Today, we emailed out with the thanks and appreciation to the Glendora Chamber of Commerce and Joe Cena for emailing our quarterly newsletter, the GOSD Community Update, to many, many families in the entire Glendora, broader Glendora community. Wonderful information, including updates on our new language programs, our new aviation classes at Glendora High School, our safety processes and programs, and it introduces many new employees to the community. It's a wonderful um, piece of information put together. Much thanks to Ms. Josie Wilson and our audience this evening and her team and many district employees for uh, giving us information to get out to that uh, interactive piece of newsletter. It's informative and, and insightful, so much appreciation. And last but not least, uh, on that last Monday at the Glendora Coordinating Council, a Youth Recognition Award was given out and it was the Tim Crowther Award. It's, spe it's a special award. And it's a person that goes above and beyond their community, connects with not only their classmates, maybe outside, maybe has some additional responsibilities, such as with the school board and maybe the city. And for her outstanding efforts, she was recognized there and wanted to make sure she was recognized here as well. Gwen Martinez, thank you for doing what you do. Received about, I don't know, 500 certific certificates as, as the community lined up and, and gave you kudos. Um, much, des much, much, de much deserved, much deserved for Gwen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. DeGrazia. We're going to move along to our staff presentations this evening. And the first up is uh, item 5.1, overview of the community survey school bond presented by FM3 Research. Mrs. Picard. Thank you very much. I look forward to introducing this topic to the board this evening. As you all know, we did a, a recent survey, and it was uh, done by FM3 Research, who did our bond survey for us um, in 2020 and so this evening I've, I would like to introduce to you Adam uh, Sunshine and um, so I'm going to have him come on up and he's going to start the presentation in the slides and uh, share with you the results. Great thank you uh, Tracy thank you board and uh, superintendent and, and guests here Adam Sunshine from FM3 Research. Uh, I'm going to take you through a little bit of the highlights of this survey and feel free to offer any questions that you might have at the end. Um, so just to give you a little sense of, of the context of how we went about doing the survey, uh, it was done uh, kind of the end of the summer there, August 19th to the 24th. Mm -hmm. uh, the universe of people who took the survey were all uh, likely voters in a November 2024 election in your district, meaning that they have a past voting history that would imply they're likely to vote again. So they're registered to vote. And either they've uh, voted in, in an election recently or they're newly registered, implying that they have some implication that they're going to be voting in a, in a future election. Um, we've matched the demographics of the sample to the demographics of those likely voters on a number of different categories, age, gender, party, ethnicity, uh, geography, to make sure that uh, the responses that we have are giving you a good snapshot of the voters in your district. Uh, we did uh, 434 interviews, it gives you a margin of error of plus or minus 4.9%, so just keep that in mind, and when you're looking at the the, the questions here, 
Uh, we reached people in a couple different ways. We did phone calls with live telephone interviewers. We also sent emails and text messages for people to take the survey online. And they could do one or the other. They could either respond by phone or respond online to give people multiple opportunities. We know some people don't like to do a survey by phone. Some people don't like to do it online. Uh, so we give them the opportunity to do both, to do one or the other. Um, we, as as uh, Tracy mentioned, we had some questions tracked to the, the project that we did in May of 2020. Uh, and then we offered the survey in English and Spanish, again, trying to give people more opportunities to participate. And you might see something that doesn't quite add up to 100% because we've rounded decimal points. Okay. Um, one of the first things we did in the survey and kind of the, the key point here is understanding opinions on a potential ballot measure. Uh, and the way to do that, we have found through our experience in our firm, is to put together a hypothetical 75-word ballot question of the kind that uh, you as a voter uh, might interact with if you, when you get your ballot, either in the mail or when you go vote in person, you're going to see that question. Um, and so we know we can't list everything you're possibly going to do within those 75 words, but we wanted to provide some illustrative examples of how the funding would be used and, and what the measure would be uh, accomplishing, along with a bunch of financial legally required language there um, that is sometimes confusing to people but is now uh, required by state law. You'll see we framed uh, and asked people about a $140 million bond that has a tax rate of six cents per $100 of assessed valuation that raises $9 million annually. And then there's a little bit of fiscal accountability provisions that are built into the measure. We would like to remind people about that at the end of the question. Um, here is the uh, just initial response to that ballot question with no preliminary information leading them to say, uh, you know, from, from the district's perspective of how they would vote. Um, in May of 2020, uh, we had a 48% who said they would vote yes on a bond measure. In the current time, in August 2023, we're up to 58% yes, 34% no, 9% who are undecided. As you know, you need 55% to pass this kind of measure. So uh, we're at nearly 6 in 10. So above that 55, but still kind of in a, in a close range there. It's not a very comfortable lead, just a few points over, over the threshold. Okay. Um, wanted to help you uh, get a little bit of a sense of what some of your voters' priorities are as it relates to the measure. Um, and so we asked them this question, how important is it to you that these various provisions and, and elements of the measure be included? Um, the dark blue is, is extremely important. It looks like the numbers might have gotten shifted over in the translation on the screen, but maybe you have it on, on paper there. Uh, and then we have the, the lighter blue next to that, and we put those together to be extremely or very important on the right-hand side. Um, some of the top things, the most important aspects of the measure include some of those fiscal accountability provisions that I mentioned, ways that people will know that the money is going to be used the way that the district says it's going to be, so things like requiring public disclosure of all spending you see near the top, um, and then uh, from and then requiring all funds used only for local Glendora Unified School District schools. Um, as you know, with this kind of measure, it's funding for your schools. And in some cases, voters feel like they vote for things and then it gets misused. It gets spent on different things. It goes to the county. It goes to the state. This is reminding them that by law, the money is only to be used for your schools. In addition to that accountability, the fact that the measure would help retain and attract teachers now with this kind of bond measure, you're not paying teacher salaries, and we're not trying to imply that, but by having quality schools, well-maintained schools, safe schools, makes it easier to, to, maintain, to retain and attract those kinds of teachers that you want. Uh, and then STEAM, uh, heard the superintendent mentioning just a, a moment ago, uh, you can see some things like improving student access to instruction in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. That's a very high priority, as well as some of the repairs that would be made. So repairing leaky roofs and uh, providing safe drinking water. Uh, these kinds of things are uh, all very high priorities. If you follow the right-hand column here, you can see that these are rating in the 90s, 80s, 70 percentile kind of level. These are all pretty high priorities for voters across the district. Okay. Um, some of the other top priorities, um, things that are maybe a few ticks down, but still over two-thirds of voters saying these are extremely or very important to them, so, so significant priorities are things like ensuring that the school district qualifies for state matching funds. So if there's a, a statewide school bond, which actually we're doing the survey work for, which may be on the ballot in November 2024, having this local bond would put you in a better position to qualify for some, some state matching funds. Um, and then some safety improvements. So you see we tested a number of things like emergency communication systems, uh, school security systems, door locks, et cetera, and all of these are 
quite high priorities for local voters in your community. So together you have a, a nice mix of things. It's not all about one aspect or another, but the repairs, the educational opportunities, the safety, along with the fiscal accountability on the whole package is something that's appealing to a, to a good number of voters. Um, so a few just overall conclusions and thinking about next steps if this is a direction you want to pursue. Um, we're seeing that $140 million bond uh, for your district is something that is worth future planning uh, and consideration. It's something that a, at least a significant number of voters are interested in. And if you do decide to go down that road, um, one of the key elements is to make sure that voters understand that some of those priorities that we see mentioned are going to get addressed by this measure. Right, and help them understand some of your needs. Like many well-run districts, um, you've got a lot to celebrate and a lot for people to feel like these schools are in great condition and everything's going well. Um, they also have to see where some of the holes are and some of the needs are for the future. Um, so what would be kind of a timeline for that between uh, now and kind of next summer, uh, you're developing and implementing that plan to, to communicate with voters, okay? so needs to start sooner than next summer, but you have this whole window between, between now and kind of June of next year. Um, in the spring to early summer of next year, call it March to June, you're developing and refining an actual project plan um, with specific projects that will be accomplished uh, throughout the district. You also need to put together a tax rate statement uh, and a resolution. So that gives, will be your actual balloting materials. I showed you just the summary that appears when people vote, but as you know from past experience probably, there's a lot more materials that go into these kinds of bonds. Um, in May of next year, um, before you as a board would have to decide whether or not you want to go forward with this kind of measure, um, what's typical is to do a follow-up survey. So as we know, things are changing rapidly these days. Uh, in the external environment, let's make sure you're not relying on survey data from last year. You have updated information when you go and vote. We can also use that to understand the impact of having some of the other things that may be on the ballot in addition to your measure. Um, so let's see how the interaction between those various things on the ballot may be impacting voter sentiment. Um, June 2024 would be roughly when you'd be voting to put this measure on the ballot or not. Your deadline is early August, but um, we want to make sure you're not waiting until the last day to do that. So you have some flexibility there, but really targeting June. And then August through the date of the election, which is November 5th, um, you can continue to provide information about uh, the measure and what, what is included in it, but it's a different kind of information than you're doing leading up to placement. And then there could be um, an outside group that forms to do a little more of the campaigning, but that's privately funded, not directed by the district, not using district funds. So just putting it out there that that could happen, but that's not run by you as a board. Okay, um, so I'll stop there and happy to take any questions or thoughts that you might have. A lot of information there. We will be coming back um, with some next steps that we'd like to be able to do for some planning over the next few months um, as we continue to um, help educate our community and uh, look at um, some other structured programs that we may also want to consider um, either in addition or um, be separate from the bond. No, I just I just have a comment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was very well thought out and I appreciate it. I just know um, that the last time we went out for a bond, it failed. And I think part of it was we didn't have enough commitment from the parents. Um, and also there was a misunderstanding of his, the assessed value. Mm -hmm. And people were like, well, my house has gone up. Well, yeah, you've lived there for 40 years. <laughs> but it's the assessed value, which is right. probably way lower. So I just know, I know this isn't your things, that we have to do that. And the oversight, I was on the bond oversight committee mm -hmm. after, from our last bond. Towards the end, thank goodness, because I know there were stacks, but I know <laughs> that I went through all of those checks that we paid and all of the bills and checked to make sure. Reports. So there really is oversight by a committee that is mm -hmm. not part of the school. I mean, there are members of it, but it's part of a um, More of a community-driven. A community-driven. Yeah. And so I think that's really important. So... Thank you. Absolutely. Appreciate your information. My pleasure. I just have a quick question. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's mm -hmm. uh, informative and it helps me understand that survey that went out to our community, what they were asked and their responses. I appreciate that. I know that this um, draft bond measure question is uh, just a draft. Just a draft. Um, but 
I know we're going to get emails on this, mm -hmm. and I want to just clarify that this is a draft, and this mm -hmm. is not what we're going after. It's just something that we are, this is like the wording that has to go out. So the $140 million, that is not something that we've decided yet, that not that is how stone. much we are going for, correct? No, it, not set in stone. The idea is that that's your, your uh, legal max is uh, what is calculated at a $60 per $100,000 mm -hmm. tax rate. So by testing the max that you can go for, you understand that option, and then as a board, you decide what's appropriate. Right, and we would decide based on the needs of the district That's and right. you know, having Absolutely. all that, those studies done mm -hmm. of what we actually need and not That's just right. trying to get as much as possible. That's right. Thank you, I just wanted to clarify that. The other piece to that, and it's a great question because I think this has been one of the concerns that community members um, over time have shared with districts and with the state representatives that they wanna make sure that we clearly mm -hmm. Um, when they're being asked the questions, that they know exactly what the language says. That was something years ago in the surveys, they didn't actually include all the language. And so we wanna make sure that our questions are also surrounded, they somewhat match kind of the areas that we have already identified as a district. The dollar amount might change, but they, we need to be really on the same consistent thing. Like I can't suddenly go off and shift and say that we're gonna go off and build another school when that was never clearly identified within the survey too. So we need to be cognizant of uh, making sure that we are transparent in what we say. All right, thank you. And just um, to reiterate, this is all just the first time we're hearing all this information. There's no action this evening. There is no action on any of this this evening. It's just something that um, we, uh, we are learning about with everybody. Um, the next presentation that we have up here um, sort of maybe answers some of the financial uh, side of this um, equation, and that is our annual financial review from Fieldman, Rollap, and Associates Incorporated, presented by Business Services and Adam Bauer. Mrs. Vicar. Thank you. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you um, our financial representative, uh, Adam Bauer. Adam was here last year, you met him then. We kind of started working on a very transparent campaign of our bond proceeds, and we provide you with an annual report in the community uh, to make sure that um, you know everybody knows exactly where the money was, how much was spent, what's going on, why are they still paying for these things. And so uh, this evening to present this evening is um, Adam Bauer. So I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, and uh, we'll start off with clearing up any ambiguity on assessed value. Um, assessed value is all commercial and residential property within the district's boundaries, and it's assigned a value based on base year when it was purchased. Due to Prop 13, that value can only go up by 2%, absent some really unusual exceptions to that. And so a home purchase in 1991 would have only gone up 2% per year Whereas we know, real, if you go on Zillow, that house is probably worth seven, eight, nine, ten times what it was purchased in 1991. So assessed value, typically people have assessed value that's lower than what they expect unless they've recently purchased that home. And so that shows on that far left there and those bar charts on the upper right. And a takeaway from someone who doesn't look at this frequently is you have a remarkably consistent assessed value. In the Great Recession, you had two negative years, but those are very small compared to most other districts. I'm not saying it didn't feel tough here like it did everywhere else. I'm just saying as far as your assessed value goes, it held up very well, and that's in large part due to not having a lot of new development and having homeowners stay in those homes for very long periods of time. There's a bottom section of this page on the far right there that I don't usually spend a lot of time talking about, but I think for your district it makes sense to do so. Every district has something called a statutory bonding capacity. And you only get access to that should a board vote to put measures, geo bond measures on the ballot, and then voters come in to support it. Absent that, it's not worth very much to you. It's just a number. And for a unified district, you take 2.5% and you multiply it by your assessed value. And that's that number right there at $192 million. Then there's that number next to it that says outstanding bonds. And that number, I think it's 34 million. Mm -hmm. And then to the right of that is your net bonding capacity. Many of the districts we work with are at or near that statutory bonding capacity, and you're nowhere near it. And so when you look at what good condition your schools are in, 
and then with how much you've asked for your voters, you've done a lot with the money. So many districts would have, like I said, a lot more debt and higher tax rates to achieve what you have with, with your schools within your district boundaries. On this page, we're just detailing some of the, or actually all the debt that the district has outstanding. And a takeaway that I look at this slide, it says your debt's been well managed. On that far right, there's no bonds that have a call date. That's when these bonds can be prepaid or taken away from investors and refinance. You have none within the current year or two. And so that shows that you've really done a good job of being proactive and making sure you've refinanced when you've had opportunities. Just to take a moment here, a refinance is not like what we do with an individual homeowner, where you oftentimes take a 30-year mortgage and you refinance it to another 30-year until you figure it out you're close to retirement, and then you jam into a 15-year to try to make it all work. These bonds never extend a term. You can't do that. You can only do it if there's savings for taxpayers. So every dollar from a refunding went directly to the taxpayers. None of it goes to the district or its operations. On this slide, it's your 2000 measure, and it's measure G. And what hopefully you're noticing here, I'm going to give some, uh, when I do these charts going forward, they're all similar. The vertical axis is tax rate per 100,000. The um, horizontal axis are years, and those colored bars represent each series of bonds. And when you add them together, it's the tax rate for that year. So here you have two series, you have two colors. And you can see these bonds are uh, fully repaid after 2027. So after that point in time, this, the taxpayers will no longer be repaying this, this uh, measure. You have a second measure from 2005, Measure G. And I didn't mention the last one. Both your measures had very high approvals. The last one required 66.67. This one only required 55% because it's a different type of measure. And um, you had 63.1. That's eight percentage points higher than what you needed and shows a real strong level of support within your community. Now, this chart has a red line on it because Prop 39, unlike the Prop 46, which have higher voting threshold, have a tax rate cap for your projection purposes. And here, what you're hopefully noticing is those bars, there's a lot of gray space between the bars and that line. And what that means is you have a lower tax rate than what you've um, asked your voters for. And so that's this one's being very well managed. Another thing that I'm going to show you this next slide here is that table at the bottom, that combines both your measures. This is what your taxpayers see in a tax bill. And um, hopefully you're noticing there's a drop off. But the other thing I hope you notice is that all your bonds are repaid by 2039. Keep in mind when many of these bonds are sold, there's a 30 year term. So if you sold bonds in 2023, oftentimes they go out to 2053. Whereas here, all the bonds in the district will be repaid within 2039. And right now, you see a significant decline in 2028. And so this is just a summary of um, your overall tax rate and what your taxpayers are seeing on their um, tax bill. The other thing I want to point out is the district has both federal and state filings. And uh, the state filings, we've already begun. Uh, you get the data as of June 30th of the, of the prior year, but it's due to be filed on January 31st. And the district is always district staff is always very proactive in giving it to us on our first or second request, which is relatively unusual. Um, and then you also have your federal filings, which are due March 31st, and that data we request after your first interim on December 15th. Um, and so the district, last time I spoke with you, I said you had some makeup filings because there were some that were missing. And those here you can see those makeup filings have been made. Um, so just this, the way the district has managed this debt and the way that you've um, really been cautious with how much you've asked for has been a contributing factor to the high credit ratings that you've received. And when it, a high credit rating is like having a high, high credit score. And to the extent we're able to maintain that, when you do borrow, your um, taxpayers pay a lower amount for every dollar that you borrow when you have GO bond measures. So you really worked well to manage your debt on, on, on behalf of the taxpayers, both under rating-wise and doing refundings. And also your state filings and federal filings are done so that if investors need information, it's all right there, one report. They can pull it up, get access to it, and it makes them more likely to be purchasers in the future. The more purchasers you have, you drive down that cost of borrowing. And so those conclude the slides that we've prepared this evening, but we're also available for any questions.
Thank you very much, Mr. Bauer. This is um, really informative and, um, to me, easy to understand, which is not typical with reports like this, but you did a really good job explaining it, so thank you very much. No. I just nothing? wait. I let Adam do the hard stuff, and I came in with the easy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Actually, I just want to thank both Adam and Adam for coming out this evening and sharing with you um, both these reports. I think they're important because we continue looking at our program fiscally and what we want to be able to do to help and support our district. Um, I'm excited about some of the financial things that we're working on and um, possibilities for options that we'll be able to present to the board here in the very near future. So thank you both very much so for your time. Great, thank you. Okay, we're going to keep right on rolling to our discussion action items. Item 6.1, announce the Board of Education attention, intention to appoint Todd Fagan as its representative to the Personnel Commission. No action w needs to be taken this evening. We will be holding a public hearing at our next board meeting. Item 6.2, approval of the developer fee annual report for the reporting period ending June 30th, 2023 as presented. May I have a motion? So moved. Second. Um, Mrs. Vicar, can you talk to us a little bit about our developer fee annual report? Yeah. I think that the report itself was available um, in, the, in the attachments on the on the agenda, thank you very much. But um, maybe you could give a little more context on what the what this fund is for, what we can do with this fund, because it ties in quite well with what we've been talking about tonight, with the track project, with any sort of bond project, all that kind of stuff. There are monies in this um, developer fee fund, and I just would appreciate some context. Sure. Um, so it's my pleasure this evening to introduce to you um, our annual report that we're providing to you. Um, this year, we um, received $306,000, roughly, a little bit more than that, uh, from developer fees. Um, it's actually down a little bit from the prior year. The prior year, we actually um, had $134,000 more than what we did this past year. And actually, over the last four years, we've had a substantial increase, mainly because our community has been building a lot of ADUs. And there have been a few new um, building projects that have happened here within the community. Um, not a great deal of projects. Um, one of the things that you have to look at is how you can spend the money from these funds that are received. They're very, very restricted as to how we go off and spend it. We're actually probably going to have to talk with an attorney about whether or not we could actually make the case to be able to use it for the track, although I've got some ideas behind that. I kind of want to be able to spend that and talk about improved conditions that are necessary uh, because we have supported so many students over the past that it's time to be able to do kind of a renovation there but I will tell you there are some things you cannot spend money on you cannot necessarily just go off and just go build or repair or add do an addition um, unless you're able to justify that you've got those new students the other place that you can justify it is with technology and so this might be a place where maybe we switch some funds that we would have used for a technology project and we might use these funds for that so it's not to say that we can't use these funds we most certainly can we just have to identify the right funding source and make sure that we kind of then move the right money into the right accounts so that we can do all the projects that we want to be able to do as a priority here at Glendora Unified. I feel like the total fund balance is three million some dollars. It is. What is, when's, and this is before you obviously, when's the last time we dipped into this fund? I mean, maybe you don't have that information off the top of your head, but like, it's a pretty good amount at this money. point in time so yeah. when when is or what project you, what 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 have we done, used this in the past for you know it's a great question i think it was used for some technology from what i could tell there's not a whole lot of um qualifications that we've gone after to be able to use these funds we cannot use it for like the chiller systems to be able to fix those we're not able to use the funds for that so again it's kind of restricted but we can, still, we can still find ways to be able to use these funds and free up some other funds that we've set aside. And I think that's probably really where we want to be able to take the time. And really, it's been since during the pandemic, there was a higher interest. Um, the ADU rules changed during that time period, and it became a lot more activity where actually these accounts actually built up over the last four years, which really gives us the ability now to be able to go make those decisions and use them for, for good reasons. 
So um, it's something that we will definitely want to be able to work with the attorneys on to make sure that we use it appropriately. We have to work with our auditors, who we spoke with earlier today, who also advise us to make sure that for some of the projects we were talking about, that we get some legal advice on it um, and to make sure that we um, appropriately use that. But having said that, there are ways, like I said, we can sit there and take a look at other things that we've earmarked for things that maybe could actually come out of this account, and that's what we would want to now earmark those monies for. And note that in our budget, right? So that would be the ideal time to do it. So yes, we definitely have a good chunk of change here to be able to work with. Um, I think that's a nice, a nice fee. Um, some districts, of course, you know, you can add, you know, another zero on there. Um, that's not us, but you know, I think it's exciting to see this this amount of money, and especially over the last four years, that build up. Okay, so we are, are um, voting to approve the report. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Item 6.3, approval of the price increase of an adult breakfast to $4.25 and the price increase of an adult lunch to $5.75 as presented. May I have a motion? So moved. I'll second that. Okay. Um, we had asked Dr. DeGrazia a couple of questions about these lunches. and um, or the, the, the require, Do we have to charge adults? for meals and I, I think this is a good question because our kids are eating for free right now which I think is wonderful uh, I just want to understand why we can't do the same thing for our all of our employees sure I think I'd be happy to try to explain that so the national lunch program that we have that our students have access to for free is really designed for students um, however we know that there are some additional meals that are also available because we just never know exactly how many meals we're able to do we're actually able to offer that as well to staff um, but we have to actually charge staff for what it actually costs us to be able to prepare the meal. And, of course, with the cost of things going up, the cost of food has gone up. And so there's actually a rate that's set for that. And so we are just following the national guidelines and passing that on. And I suspect it's been quite some time since we've had a previous rate. Increase. That, very long that was going to be my question. What is the current rate for that? Oh, gosh, I want to say it was 250 Let me see. It's inside the report here. I don't remember passing this, and I've been on the board for eight years. So. I remember when we had to, um, when you all voted to increase the student price by 25 cents a couple of years ago. I was like, I think it was an increase by 75 cents for each meal. And okay. do we have a lot of uh, adults that actually purchase the breakfast and lunch? Like Not how as many as I'd like to see, we would actually like to be able to increase that. Um, we may have more in the future. Yeah, yeah Chef Aaron. Based on, yeah. Better menus coming up. <laughs> Yeah, she has some very creative ideas um, to be able to serve students and also to be able to entice staff into some other healthy options uh, that would be good for all of us, which really fits nicely with our wellness program that we are um, celebrating this year. Great. All those in, uh, you have any questions? More questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, board. <clears throat> Um, uh, item number seven, consent items. The Board of Education may consider agenda consent items as a whole or as individual divisions. Any item may be removed by a member for the board, excuse me, of the board for discussion and possible action. Would anybody like to pull any consent items? Madam President, I'll make a motion to approve items 8, 1 through 11. Um, I'm going to pull 11, 1 and 11, 2 for clarification. Uh, but all the other ones, I'll make a motion to approve. Okay. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Um, items 11.1 .1 and 11.2, approve slash ratify the certificated personnel employments, retirements, resignation, and leaves, and approve slash ratify. Do I have to take them one at a time? No, that's... I, have the same. I mean, it's the so. same. You have the same question about both. So I'm going to... Uh, approve slash ratify the classified personnel, employments, retirements, resignations, and leave. Can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Mr. Clifford. Thank you. And thank you for providing a lot of information on the report background information. But this is my query. Uh, from If I do Clifford math, <clears throat> it looks like I'm approving on 11-1 an additional $81,363 towards um, salaries, uh, and I'll classify those as basically 
additional pay in the forms of stipends, overtime pay, and other related items um, to our teachers that are doing the work. Um, what I don't understand, and, and I want to approve those, um, what I don't have in front of me is the comparison to the budget of that number. So in, in essence, in this two-week period, on just the uh, certificated employees, it's 81,000. I didn't do the math on the classified. Um, that two-week period? Well, since the last board meeting. So this, since the last board meeting, every board meeting we're approving some amount. But in this amount, if it, and I haven't gone and looked at all the other amounts, but they're significant. So this is 80,000. So I'm, I, I'm estimating that we're approving somewhere 100 to $125,000 a month in those fees on the consent calendar. What I would like <clears throat> affirmation of from somebody is that that's within our budget. And I know the budget or number is somewhere in the million to 1.2. I don't have it in front of me. What would be helpful when I'm looking at these items is just a simple sentence to say this is within our budget or it exceeds our budget. I think those, that's a legitimate request, at least for me, so I know when I'm voting in the affirmative that I'm voting within the budgetary restraints. And if I'm not, if it exceeds the budget, I would like to be able to know what remedies we're going to put in place. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. And I, I couldn't find that data anywhere. I called the superintendent, and this is the appropriate time to ask that question. So that's my 11.1 .1 question specifically, and then that will also truncate to 11.2. So I can maybe answer a couple of the fiscal pieces on this. So um, there's two things that we do. When we have a position control document that we're actually using, and in that position control, it goes through several different departments to ensure that we have the funds actually available to be able to do that. At the beginning of this presentation, when you see the initial slide that sits there and talks about whether or not these items are budgeted, we actually say yes, they are, or no, it's not. And if not, we actually give you an explanation um, actually on our agenda document that we have. And so there's actually a page, and I'll show it to you afterwards, where it actually shows you the budget pieces of budgeted. We say yes. Um, and so, but there are times that I will tell you that we do see documents that come in, and it hasn't been budgeted. And we go back and we make sure that we identify the appropriate resource. Um, that really is what our LCAP is really all about. We want to make sure that it ties back to our LCAP goals. Um, and also sometimes we have certain needs for certain kinds of support systems that we didn't anticipate. And if so, we need to share that with you so that you know there's been a change. And if so, we would actually note those also during our uh, fiscal presentations that we do either for um, the first or second um, interim um, budget presentations that we do during the school year. So from the time that you adopt the budget, we would come back and we would let, let you know if there's been any changes to some of those major columns that would have, a, have an impact on that. So we're really glad that you're asking the question. We do need to make sure that we stay within our guidelines of what we're able to do. A lot of times we're not able to actually fill all the positions right on time, or sometimes people say, no, I'm not going to do that today. Instead, somebody else is going to come in and come take that over. And so sometimes you have some changes that are happening with that. But it's a, it's a great observation. I want to thank you so much for bringing that to, um, to everyone's attention because it is really important that it is budgeted. I think there's a difference if something's budgeted <clears throat> or if it's within budget. Because you can, you can show me an item that's budgeted, but it might not be within the budget. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? When, when I see something that says the fiscal impact, yes, it has an impact. See, I, I would say no, it doesn't have an impact because it's budgeted. But if it has an impact and it's budgeted, I just want to know if, if it's within the budget, not budgeted. Those are two different things financially to me. Like I could, I could say I want to put a roof on my house and I budget for it. It's a budgeted item, but it's $2,000 over the budget. Right. And I could still legally say that, yes, it's a budgeted item, but you know, that, yep. that's all I'm asking because that's a big number. It is. <clears throat> my <clears throat> colleagues sometimes <throat> get to see documents that go back where we ask for some additional information to make sure that we find the appropriate category to make sure it gets put in. And that staff also then knows exactly which category it should be in. So my specific question, you're saying that, yes, this number is 
budgeted and it's within the budget that we approve. Yes. So none of these things are outside of the budget. That's my understanding. Correct. Okay, that's the that's the question mm -hmm. and that's the answer. Mm -hmm. So I'm ready to vote on it. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Yeah. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any oppose? The motion carries. Okay, that brings us to item 12.1. Wait, we have to do, so 11.1 and 11.2. Oh, we got to do them separate? Oh, yeah. Okay, item 11.2, approve, ratify the classified personnel employments, retirements, resignation, and leaves. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries as well. Now we're going to the adjournment of the meeting. May I have a motion? So moved. A second. Oh, I think it was Robin. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? We adjourn at 8.30 p.m. Thank you very much.